Hello. Thanks for staying with us until 5.30. It's good to see you here. If you have come to see a talk about platform operations and you'd like to see a real-life case study uh, of that on Jamalto, you're in the right place. If you don't want to see that, please leave and uh, find a talk which is uh, what you're expecting. Um, we're going to talk a bit about who we are, and we also want to find out a little, about, a little bit about who, who you are. So I'll ask you a couple of questions about that, just so we understand who's in the room. So firstly, Vincenzo, who are you and why are you here? So I'm a, an automation architect at uh, Gemalto. Uh, Gemalto is a, a company which uh, is the leader in digital security. We provide a lot of uh, uh, different products. I'm in the uh, enterprise and cybersecurity uh, business unit, so we deal more with uh, uh, access authentication and uh, uh, data protection. And I'm here to present you uh, the Depod solution, a uh, solution that uh, we built on top of uh, uh, Cloud Foundry uh, with the help of uh, uh, Dan and uh, uh, Engineer Better. And, and my name's Dan Young. I work at Engineer Better. We're a consultancy who work a lot with Cloud Foundry customers, um, including Pivotal Cloud Foundry customers, and that's the version we'll be talking about today. And we've helped a lot of our customers um, learn to operate platforms in a cloud-native way. So what we do is, and what I'll be talking about today is uh, getting a team working process that really engenders this idea of a platform being a product that you operate for your customers inside the business, not the traditional notion of, of um, IT operations. So that's what I'll be talking about today, and, and that's really what we're going to be, I'm going to be focusing on today, is helping you, and hopefully you'll be able to take away today some examples of what it means to really operate a platform like that, and not just at the team level, like not just how does the team behave, but what does the team do, and what's different about that compared to traditional IT operations. And Vincenzo, what's your specialist topic today? So I will uh, talk about uh, data protection on demand. Uh, I will show you uh, why we uh, propose this uh, platform, what kind of advantages we expect you to have by using the service. <laughs> And uh, I will uh, also show you uh, high level the architecture of the solution and uh, how we engineered it uh, on, on top of Cloud Foundry using the Cloud Foundry concept. So the Depod platform that Vincenzo is going to go into detail on is underpinned by Cloud Foundry. In this case, it's Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And the way we encourage our customers to work with this platform is to think of it like a product. So they organize their team to have a product mindset and that's an autonomous team, and they have control over everything about the way the platform is deployed, all the technologies around it and everything it's plugged into. And they operate with that product mindset, so we often uh, encourage either the customer who we're working with or ourselves to provide a product manager, so someone who's really going to think about what the internal needs of the customer are in this in organization, uh, and then operate a... Uh, and a relationship with that customer that is defined by what we call the, the platform contract. So there's an agreement between the consumers of the platform, who are the, the developers and the operators of the platform, that it will do certain things for them. And Engineer Better, we've sort of been thinking recently about how to express this, and this idea has uh, come from someone called Colin, who works, who's the CTO of Pivotal Cloud, and it's pretty much it, 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 this, this is a picture which describes what we believe DevOps is evolving to. So, originally, if you forget about the top right and the bottom left, we just had application developers trying to get their stuff into production by talking to IT operations teams, and that contract line didn't exist. It was a wall. It was like the Berlin Wall between these two teams. And there was no real relationship there at all. And it was just people throwing things over this wall and trying to get stuff done. And then DevOps came along and we said, OK, well, maybe if we could merge those two teams together, they'll work really well together because they'll just be one contiguous cross-functional team. The problem with that is that then everybody's operating everything in the entire technology stack again and again and again across the whole organization for every application. That doesn't make sense either. But what happens if you get really, really good at DevOps, and you're very, very good at configuration management, and you're amazing at containers, and you can plug all this stuff together, you end up with Cloud Foundry. 
So that's where you get to if you're really, really good at all of that stuff. So why don't you just start using that anyway? And then if you can operate Cloud Foundry with a product mindset, you're able to present to your internal users that notion of a platform contract and an API. So if they can't do stuff through the API, it's not worth bothering about. So what we're focusing on in this presentation is that bottom product team there in the dotted line. We're encouraging uh, Jamalto and uh, the engineers we've been working with to think about how to form that team. The philosophy that we have in that team is all about small batch sizes and fast feedback. So everything we do is trying to encourage uh, a way of working that allows us to learn faster. So the automation we have and the continuous deployment of the platform, the purpose of that continuous deployment pipeline is to form a feedback loop so that you can learn very, very quickly about what you're doing. So that's the first part of it. The next part is having a sustainable engineering culture. This is in contrast to what you've had in IT operations for a couple of decades, which is heroics. So in IT, we've always had heroes. And heroes, um, some of them are the nicest people you've ever met, but they are not healthy for a team because they become silos of knowledge and then that person becomes indispensable. You know, that, that idea of the bus factor. If, some, if that one person got hit by a bus, everything would stop. And if things are going badly, that one person gets completely overloaded with all the work. So we encourage teams to get away from that idea. And one of the ways of doing that is through pair programming. So we will pair with our customer teams, and we've been doing that with Jamalto's team, so that the knowledge is diffused without, uh, throughout the team, and there is no one person who becomes the hero. That person can do all the work. And the way we work is by having a single prioritized backlog of work, and that, encourages to, that means that we're always working on the most important thing, and we always do that in the simplest possible way. So when you, when you, do, when you have one clear prioritized backlog of work, and you are totally open to the idea of changing the priorities of that list continually, you can embrace change. And this is also very different to the traditional IT ops, where everyone says no all the time. In a team like, that operates like this, you can say yes. You say, OK, if that's the most important thing this morning, that's going up the list. But oh, look what's happening. This other priority is coming down the list. Do you still want to do that? Oh, you don't. OK, it's going back up the list. And we use the backlog to communicate clearly with our customers inside the organization who are asking for these conflicting things. What do you, it forces them to think about what's really important. And it becomes a communication tool for us. So we're able to say yes to change, but we also make it clear what that means. There's a trade-off in that decision. And we've done this with the Jamalto team here in Ottawa. So they sent some people over to us who we've been pair programming with. It's quite possible we'll send some people back over to them. And in the meantime, we're doing remote pair programming to make sure we get that contiguous uh, fast feedback in the team. Because pair programming enables that as well. If you're pairing with someone, you learn uh, very quickly when you're doing the wrong thing. So that's the way the team has been working. I was going to give you a, a brief look at how we've actually been working with the technology. So how many people in the room are operating Cloud Foundry at the moment? OK, so, and how many people are the consumers of the platform? So like the developers or, OK, not so many, but I wouldn't expect to that. And who's an architect? OK, so we've got half architects and sort of half operations people. This, um, how many people are using Concourse? OK, good, good number of you. Hopefully, some things in here you'll expect to see. Some things might be new to you. Um, come and ask us afterwards if, if that's uh, new stuff. So. We have every pipeline, uh, every foundation we build for the customer is completely and utterly reproducible, and we can have as many of them on demand as we want to. We don't name them after their semantic meaning, so we have no dev uh, staging or production platform. We just uh, pick a naming scheme, so we've chosen arthropods, and that enables us to decouple the names of the platforms from what they actually do. This is really, really useful when you've got three production environments, and you can just map on to their uh, you know, their arthropod name. So we've got complete reproducibility. Every single one of them is a bit for bit replica of the next one, because we've got a single piece of YAML pipeline for everything. 
Uh, we've got some optimizations for cost, so we'll sleep non-production pipelines at night. So we shut down all the instances uh, at night when not, not being used in non-production environments. Uh, got continuous upgrades from PivNet, which we're caching into S3, and then we're applying those as they come out. So we're, we're narrowing the, the time of exposure to CVEs to mere hours. And in most enterprises, it's days, if not weeks and weeks, of people being exposed to CVEs. So we're narrowing that down. And for Gemalto, that's pretty important, right? Because you're a security organization, so <laughs> yeah, don't want to be exposed to CVEs. Then at the end of the pipeline, as you might expect, we're continuously testing. We're doing continuous smoke testing for acceptance. So we know we'll run that every five minutes or every 10 minutes, in addition to other monitoring. So we know, can I push an app? Can I stop an app? Can I start an app? Can I scale an app? These are basic functions. And I'm testing, when we're do the, doing this, we're testing that platform contract. It's like, am I delivering the things that I promised that I said I would do for the customer? The last thing you can see there uh, in the normal production pipeline is, or sorry, the, um, uh, the staging pipeline or any of the other intermediate pipelines is this stopover pattern. So what we did was, originally, if, you're, if you've got multiple environments and you want to promote change from dev to staging to production in Cloud Foundry, what you could do was just build a gigantic pipeline and have groups in concourse for expressing the different pipelines. That's not great. So what we did was this stopover idea that you can snapshot the, the, the numbers of all the versions of the resources that went into making that pipeline green. And if you snapshot all the versions by querying the concourse that you're running um, using ATC, using the API, you can then get those versions and export them uh, and use them as parameters to pass into your next pipeline. This is uh, really advantageous because then we can then have we can promote change. We know exactly what made that pipeline go green in staging. We will pass exactly the same versions of all the resources into another pipeline by by by, by, by means of parameters. So that's me. I've sort of spent about half the time talking about the team and about the technology. And then what uh, Vincenzo is going to do now is talk a bit about what Depod does on top of that platform layer for Gemalto. So uh, the <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so the DPod stands for uh, uh, SafeNet Data Protection on Demand, and uh, what we uh, what we built uh, on Jamalto side was to uh, a cloud-based platform uh, that could provide you uh, a wide range of uh, on-demand uh, uh, key management and encryption services. Uh, the main idea was uh, that you can uh, uh, get access to uh, a lot of uh, data protection services without having to deploy any hardware on uh, your premises and having uh, immediate access to uh, a lot of uh, uh, different functionalities that uh, could cover your uh, data protection use cases, especially considering uh, uh, new requirements that uh, uh, are coming with uh, uh, new regulations like the GDPR, for just to mention one of them. And all these. Uh, through a simple online marketplace where you can have a user interface that gives you just a point and click, choose your service, and then uh, you are ready to, to use a, a data protection service in your applications. <coughs> so when, uh, when we started the Depot uh, project, we had a, a, a quite tight uh, Timeline. Uh, we had to come up with uh, uh, with this product from an idea to uh, an actual uh, deployment in production in a, uh, a very short time frame. And uh, uh, the what we had was a set of business goals that uh, we wanted to achieve. So uh, we had to uh, ensure proper tenant isolation so that we could have uh, a platform that would allow us to uh, to, to properly isolate the different uh, uh, tenants that we would serve. Uh, a click and deploy approach so that our customers would uh, easily through a, uh, through a user interface be able to activate the, the service that they needed. Uh, a centralized platform, so having uh, uh, all these services managed in a central place. Uh, and uh, uh, a utility model pay as you go so that our customers didn't need to, uh, uh, to, to do an initial investment, for example, uh, as it is normally the case with a HSM device. Uh, and at the same time have a, a, a virtually unlimited capacity <laughs> and infinite scalability. And these to accommodate different kind of, of uh, uh, needs from uh, our different customers. 
and uh, finally also the, have the possibility to be always up to date. Uh, this for many reasons, especially uh, from a security perspective, being able to uh, provide uh, uh, always the best uh, services for data protection. So, uh, in this slide, I'm trying to give you an idea of uh, how the uh, depot service is going to, uh, what are the main workflows that we uh, set up for uh, the depot solution. Uh, we have uh, three main actors. Uh, the, the first one is the uh, Gemalto operations team, here represented by a Gemalto service provider admin. And uh, this, is a, uh, uh, this is a workflow which is triggered when uh, uh, we onboard a new tenant. So uh, when uh, uh, one of our customers buys the service, uh, we have a, an initial provisioning activity which consists in creating a, a tenant. We create a, a domain inside the uh, Pivotal Cloud uh, Foundry platform. Uh, we set some initial uh, credentials uh, for, uh, for the new tenant and uh, we trigger an automatic deployment of applications in a tenant dedicated organization uh, and uh, space inside the uh, Pivotal uh, Cloud Foundry platform. Uh, at this stage, uh, we provide our customer with uh, some initial credentials, and on the customer side, uh, a, a user with a tenant administration role will uh, uh, use the initial credential, uh, change them after the first access, and have the possibility to, ad to administer this uh, uh, um, online marketplace of services for uh, the customer organization. Within the customer organization, the tenant administrator is also able to create uh, uh, groups and uh, users that uh, uh, will be able to uh, uh, create their uh, access uh, to, to the different services that are available on the marketplace. So in a way, the tenant administrator is uh, managing the uh, set of services available in the depot platform, and uh, it uh, uh, provides access only to uh, some, uh, uh, a subset of users within the, the customer organization itself. And uh, these users are uh, playing the role of tenant application owners. And uh, uh, these uh, are the final users of the service. So these are the uh, users that are uh, actually using the uh, data protection services. And uh, uh, in this uh, specific work workflow, we are uh, uh, showing how they create uh, one of the different services available in the marketplace, which is the HSM uh, service. The HSM service gives the uh, tenant app owner the possibility to have uh, uh, instantly provisioned an uh, HSM service that can be consumed uh, directly from, uh, from, the, uh, fr from the tenant applications. Uh, what happens, uh, we'll see it more in detail in another slide, is that uh, as soon as the tenant uh, creates, uh, requests the creation of a new service, uh, the depot platform will uh, uh, create a partition in one of uh, uh, our HSMs and uh, it will uh, uh, compile a bundle, uh, which we call client package, that the tenant application owner can, uh, can download. And this bundle contains some uh, uh, libraries that allow the client application to uh, communicate with the, uh, with, with the HSMs. So the main building blocks of this solution are uh, a component which is uh, completely implemented on Cloud Foundry, which is the Depot, and we run this in uh, uh, the AWS public cloud. And uh, uh, Depot provides in uh, in AWS the let's say the entire uh, management uh, uh, side of the of the application. So what I just described, and then we have the uh, HSMs, uh, which are fronted by a set of uh, uh, microservices. Uh, that are hosted in a, in a Gemalto data center, which is connected to the, the, to the AWS public cloud, cloud over a, a VPN connection. The customer uh, application owners are able to access the uh, depot management interface uh, directly over the internet through the credentials that are assigned to them. And uh, uh, then they, uh, once they download their uh, uh, client package, uh, they extract the uh, crypto key library that their application are able to use in order to communicate uh, with, uh, with the HSMs hosted in the, uh, in the Gemalto data centers. So uh, how did uh, we leverage the uh, features of uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry in order to uh, create this service? Uh, what we did was to uh, deploy inside the specific organization and space uh, some of uh, uh, the uh, 
components of the Depot solution, which is uh, uh, following a microservice uh, architecture. Uh, without entering too much into the details of the, of the components, uh, the, the, the interesting uh, thing here is that uh, the microservices that we deploy in, uh, inside this uh, uh, Jamalto organization and space are uh, in charge of doing two things. Uh, during the tenant provisioning phase, they're in charge of creating uh, a tenant uh, organization and space in which we will deploy the microservices that uh, represent uh, one of the services available on the marketplace, like in this case, the HSM as a service uh, service. Uh, then the microservices which are inside this uh, organization and space are uh, completely under, under the control of the, of the tenant. So in a way, we, we use uh, Cloud Foundry, uh, creating some organization for each of our uh, uh, tenants. Uh, and uh, the tenants have access to the uh, functionalities of all the modules that are running inside this dedicated uh, space. And uh, the final thing is the uh, uh, important thing is that we implemented the service broker, which uh, in the case of the HSM as a service, provide uh, uh, brokers the access to the HSM gateway, which is the component which has uh, access to the real HSMs which are deployed in our uh, Gemalto data centers. So uh, about uh, the future today, uh, the, the service that I show, uh, the architecture I show you is uh, deployed in uh, uh, Canada. Uh, we are actually building a, a, the service in a new region in uh, Germany, in Frankfurt. And uh, we are going to add uh, uh, more regions depending on the uh, customer needs and customer demand. Uh, we That's are, to do with the proximity between the Cloud Foundry and the, the HSMs. Correct. Right? Yeah. So at the moment, we have everything in Europe, but it's also talking to HSMs that are in the US. So um, at, at this very moment, we're deploying a new production environment using the same concourse patterns that I was talking about. So take a new foundry, uh, spin it up in a North American AWS region, uh, and then um, connect it up. This is, is a lot of the deployment of the, uh, let's say, AWS part, <laughs> the cloud foundry part in uh, all the different AWS regions. Uh, then uh, we are going to add new data protection services. Uh, today we have the HSM as a service, and uh, we are adding uh, uh, some uh, uh, additional services uh, that we have in our roadmap in uh, uh, 2017 and 2018. Uh, we are going also to provide uh, uh, services like transparent data encryption. Uh, today we are, you, we are uh, just providing you the possibility to uh, use the HSM as a service as a key vault or to store uh, the root of trust of your PKI. And uh, we are working together with the engineer better also on uh, a better network topo topology uh, to improve the, uh, uh, the way we are building our uh, um, uh, let's say our deployments in, uh, in AWS. So as you might expect, being an enterprise um, that is combining public cloud with data centers and external agencies, the networking can become quite complex. And the way it's evolved has been starting with VPN connectivity into AWS, but evolving towards uh, Direct Connect. And uh, up until now, we've been taking these VPN connections directly into the VPC that the PCF is deployed into. That doesn't give us a lot of flexibility because um, if there's any disruption to um, that, that VPC, then the, the VPN connection is going to be interrupted as well. We, we want to be able to consider those VPCs, those PCFs, as fairly disposable and fairly ephemeral. The VPN connection shouldn't be. So that what we're going to try and do uh, in collaboration with Jamalto is have a transit VPC. So we actually pass our data center traffic into a VPC that can then distribute and route the traffic to multiple cloud foundries depending on where they are, uh, potentially on a global scale. And that's going to change the way that um, we deploy uh, the network level. And then the, okay, the, last, the last point is uh, continuous uh, audit mechanisms on, uh, on the, on the uh, depot platform. An important thing that I missed is that, uh, talking about the new data protection services, there is also the uh, FIPS compliance of the service. Today it's a FIPS 140 uh, level 2 compliance, and uh, we are uh, aiming to have a level 3 compliance by uh, beginning of 2018. And there's also GDPR compliance as well. 
uh, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the point of the continuous audit is that, um, again, traditionally audits treated as kind of a point in time activity. You do like a check of everything and then you say, oh, we're done now. If you're continuously deploying the platform and you're continuously testing the platform, why aren't you continuously auditing the platform? So that's what we want to do is we want to build into concourse proof for the auditors that we are compliant with all the things we're supposed to be compliant with. And we're, tech we're checking it continuously. So we just need to know the rules that we need to be compliant with and we'll build it into our system testing. And, uh, oops. If you want uh, to have more details about the depot service, uh, I provide you here a few links. Uh, there is a, uh, an entire site where you can uh, uh, get all the deta details and also some uh, product briefs on uh, depot. Uh, there is also a registration form to sign up for a trial of 30 days for the service. And there is a video on YouTube which gives you also a glimpse of uh, how the user interface looks like and what kind of services you might be able to find uh, right now in the, on, on the depot uh, platform. We'll update these slides on Shared and um, put them on SlideShare or something and, and tweet about it if you want them. Okay, any questions? Q&A. Any questions? Yes. Um, we've got a mic. Is it on? Not sure. Give it a go. I'm possibly going to ask a really stupid question. So. No such thing as a silly question. Um, I'm not an expert in either field, um, but was wondering if there was any overlap between what you were looking at for continuous audit and uh, compliance masonry, which is a thing I've heard of but don't know much about. I haven't heard of it, but um, potentially, what does it do? Is so, it oh, um, you want to talk about compliance masonry? Uh, it, it automates uh, compliance documentation, so it's a way of uh, users like the open control schemas to build um, the kind of documentation that you need and tell you where you're missing controls. It sounds very useful. I can imagine that um, we would, um, if we didn't do that natively inside the concourse jobs, what we might do is um, even go as far as writing a resource for something like that. And you, you know, it's fairly common for um, advanced concourse users to write a resource for enterprise tooling that they need to interact with. But that sounds really good, like generating the, the audit documentation, yeah. Yeah, so it definitely would maybe be um, not a competing tool, but something that could be compatible. Anyone else? Okay. Well, we'll be here um, immediately after the talk if you want to come and grab us for questions. Um, if not, uh, yeah, they'll, you can uh, find us. You're on Twitter? Yeah. Jincenzo? Okay. So you, uh, come and grab our <laughs> Twitter handles. Um, we should have put them on the slides, but we didn't. <laughs> So that's a mistake. But yeah, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, thank uh, you. I hope that you uh, have a good evening and enjoy the rest of the conference.